Welcome to the first of these events, the leadership panels that have been organised by the Monash Business School. I'm going to give you a bit of background to it in a moment. Can I just open by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting. I pay my respect to their elders, past and present, and the elders from other communities who may be uh, here today. Uh, my name is Graeme Samuel. I chair the Business Advisory Board of the Monash Business School and am particularly pleased uh, to be hosting this event because it's the first of a number of leadership panels that we're going to be conducting through the year and uh, on into next year uh, in a range of different subjects. And I'll, as we get to the end today, I'm going to tell you about those other subjects because there's some fascinating uh, areas that uh, we're going to uh, discuss. Um, I should, just a matter of brief housekeeping, uh, mention to you that there are, uh, we've got a live streaming that is going on uh, at the back. and so. Uh, I'm told here photographic video or audio recordings may be taken in this area and your presence in and around these premises may result in your being filmed. It's a bit like being on Q&A. Such recordings may be used... Re please don't... If you don't like a particular topic, don't throw a shoe at any of the speakers. Yeah. That wouldn't be helpful. <laughs> so such recordings may be used, reproduced, published, communicated or broadcast for advertising, marketing, information or promotional purposes and or for teaching and research purposes. If you don't wish to have photographic, video, audio or other visual portrayals of you, please advise the coordinator of this event or the photographer or videographer. So does anyone really object to being photographed or heard or seen? That's good. So your excuse for being here is valid. OK. Um, what we're going to do is um, have, I think, a really interesting format. So the whole process is that we want to engage in a conversation, conversation between the members of our panel uh, and then, as is appropriate, with you here that have come along to become participants in the process. So it is intended to be a very interactive session. Um, a couple of the panellists asked me before, what's the first question? I said, you'll find out when Amy asks it. But, uh, so none of what we're relying on is that the panellists have got extraordinary expertise, and I'm going to introduce them in a moment, in a whole range of different areas, and that will enable them to deal with the sorts of I hope provocative questions that Amy Oster is going to put to them and that you might put to them and if you don't like what they have to say then we're going to ask you to put up your hand and when Amy asks you quickly state who you are, where you're from and say your piece but keep it brief because we do want to hear from our panellists and the like. There is one technical problem we've got which is that um, to, in order for the live streaming if you want your view to be heard on the live stream you're going to have to get a microphone. And so we will have people that will be running microphones around, but we're actually a bit limited because of the live streaming. So um, the other way would be if you've got a loud voice, if you could when you get up, speak very loudly and very clearly and we'll see whether that comes through on the live stream. I'll be told uh, it won't properly, but uh, we'll see what we can do. It's a bit of a technical thing. So could you please, if, if we can, we'll get a microphone to you, wait for it and then say your piece uh, and particularly tell us who you are, where you're from and put your view or your questions as the case may be and we'll, we'll try and keep it very interactive. Now, the panellists, and um, I always say with these things some people don't need an introduction but I will introduce them. Um, you will clearly recognise our uh, wonderful former Premier, the Honourable Steve Brax, AC, he's the former Premier of Victoria and now our leading company director, he's chair of CBUS uh, and an international uh, consultant uh, particularly, I think Steve's still advising the East Timor government on governance issues. Um, uh, and he's a member of the Monash Business School, uh, a business advisory board. Don Argus also will be well known to you. Don Argus AC, former CEO of NAB. It would be interesting to ask you, Don, about... Uh, I was going to say bank taxes, no, bank levies. Right? We call them bank levies. He's former chairman of BHP. He's the chairman of Bank of America Merrill Lynch Australian Advisory Board and a member of the Bank of America Global Advisory Council. So it'd be really interesting to hear some of Don's views about particularly what's happening in Europe and um, uh, Donald Trump, if he's still president. I'm not sure whether impeachment proceedings have occurred already. Um, <laughs> he's also a member of the Monash uh, Business School Advisory Board. Professor Gary Sampson has joined us. He was the first person to be awarded a Doctor of Philosophy uh, in economics within the Faculty of Economics and Politics. Now, Gary's got a CV that is this long, and I won't spend all night telling you about it, but the important issues that I thought were these. In 1996, he was appointed um, a director at the General Agreement on Tariff and Trade in Geneva, that's GATT, uh, and then in 1995, director at the World Trade Organization, where he was directed a number of divisions. In 2001, he was appointed senior counselor in the office of the Director General at the WTO. 
He is, interestingly, the most highly placed Australian to have worked at both GATT and the WTO. Um, he holds a chair in international economic governance at the Institute of Advanced Studies at the United Nations University in Tokyo and has written extensively on all areas of economics. And then our facilitator, who's actually going to provoke, get them all going and um, get the conversation really going, is Amy Oster. Amy is the Deputy Secretary of Economic at the Victorian Department of Treasury and Finance. She's the former Executive Director of the Australian Centre for Financial Studies within the uh, Monash Business School and is an adjunct senior research fellow in the Monash Business School. So with that, I'm off. Uh, we're gonna I'm staying, but of course, but uh, <laughs> I'm off the stage. I'm going to hand to Amy and Amy is going to start the proceedings. Thanks. Thanks, Graham. I think I'm going to, we have a lapel mic, so I'm going to put that, uh, yeah, perhaps one of these. pass it over there for, for the time being. And, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll kick off with, the, with a question, all very off the cuff, which I've prepared, prepared earlier. Um, so the topic for our discussion tonight, Trump, Brexit, and the EU wither Australia. So I thought I'd, I'd kick off with kind of a, a big, uh, big picture question on what's happening out there in the wider world, and then we can bring it down, bring it to how that affects us here in Australia and what we need to think about. Um, so the first qu question that I have for panelists is um, Donald Trump's election and the Brexit vote were both seen as victories for populism. Uh, both Donald Trump and Theresa May represent conservative parties but have won their elections based on a right-wing populist platform. What do you see as common factors or different factors, what's in common and what's not, um, between these two voter decisions, and how do they relate to the the politics and, and economics that are that we see prevalent in the world today? So I don't know who wanna who wants to <coughs> kick off. Premier. Right. Um, <coughs> okay. Well, I might um, might turn this on. Okay. All right. Well, I might uh, I might kick off and. Um, in some senses, there is not a similarity. That is that Theresa May is a mainstream conservative, if, if you like, a, um, a centre-right uh, leader, which is quite traditional. Donald Trump is not. He's an insurgent in his own party. He's an insurgent in his administration. Theresa May is certainly not that. So there's no commonality in that respect. The commonality, I think, exists because of the, the vote if you like, which um, in a voluntary voting system, both Brexit and the US elections were voluntary voting, as distinct from Australian compulsory voting. And so the, um, the commonality is that it, in, it um, enthused and encouraged people, if you like, disenfranchised from globalisation, worried about immigration, um, worried about where the economy was going and the effect of globalisation and so sort of attracted to protectionism, attracted to nationalism issues, that they caused them to come out and vote where they previously probably didn't come out and vote. And that is the commonality, if you like, that happened both in the US elections where, um, where the, the actual voluntary vote was not much different to the previous uh, vote which Obama had, but the composition of it was different. Whereas he had a, a greater number of Latinos, African Americans and others who, who voted, Trump had much more from the Midwest of people who, choose, who chose not to vote last time but chose to vote this time. And so that explains a bit about the Electoral College and why he was able to tip the election even though he didn't get a majority because he got the results where it, where it mattered. And the same in Britain, if you like, uh, with Brexit, you know, in voluntary voting, and I think in the UK it can get down as low as 60% in elections at times. But it was a reasonably high vote, but a reasonably high vote demographically amongst older, um, older uh, people from Great Britain and those, if you like, in traditional Rust Belt areas who came out in bigger numbers and the same sort of effect happened um, in both those places. What's interesting is that they were both close. You know, it could have tipped either way. Um, you know, Donald Trump had the perfect storm, really, didn't he? He, he needed an insider, he needed an institutional candidate, he needed someone who was uh, part of a dynasty in Washington, and he had that running against him. So he really had, you know, the sort of rolled gold position, which is the only probably way he could have got up. Any half-reasonable 
I'm not saying Hillary Clinton wasn't reasonable. She would have been a great um, president, uh, very, very good. But uh, electability was a problem. Uh, there was a lot of uh, baggage, as you know, um, over a long period of time. If it had been the, the vice president, if it had been someone else standing, it would have been a quite different outcome, probably. If they had paid attention to those people who felt disenfranchised. That's how close it is. That's why we're talking about it now. It was so close, it tipped over, we're talking about it now. Um, it may have been quite different if the result was different, of course. What's more interesting, I think, is the contagion effect which was predicted to happen around the rest of the world, and particularly in Europe, has not occurred. It has not occurred in the Netherlands. It has not occurred in France. And from all reports, it definitely won't occur in Germany, which is largely business as usual, with the polls showing that um, Angela Merkel and her social democratic opponent uh, are largely leading the field. That is a business as usual election in in Europe and certainly in, uh, in Germany. Uh, and whilst the polls are closing for Merkel, she probably will get there, but it doesn't matter because the, whether it's a, a centre right or a centre left, it's still much the same that's always happened. Um, I think the, if I can have a common thread amongst um, uh, Brexit and Trump, it is the fracturing of the centre. And I think this is quite dangerous for Western democracies. Um, Western democracies have li relied on a strong centre, a strong centre left, a strong centre right, and at times it changes, a liberal democracy if you like. You know, what, what's happened in, in America, it's gone to an illiberal democracy, um, uh, where the rule of law is not adhered to as strongly as it, as it has been in a liberal democracy, and you're seeing that writ large in what's happening with Trump at the moment. He's disrespect for institutions, um, he's an insider, a bit like Gorbachev, who wants to smash the place up. Um, you know, he wants to smash up communism, he wants to smash up um, the checks and balances in the United States. Where it ends, I don't know. Um, Graham might be right, it might end in impeachment. I suspect it won't. I suspect it will go on for some time. Mm. So, Don, for the, for the business community in the U.S. and, you know, outside the U.S., if, uh, if Steve is right and this represents a smashing of the center, what, is, what does that mean for the business community trying to kind of operate in that environment? Look, I, I don't uh, necessarily agree that it's a populist movement. I, I see it's a swing back to a nationalistic movement and, and people are now starting to worry about where is the future for them. I see that coming through in, uh, in my associations with the European business people. I saw it in uh, the UK and, and uh, certainly the UK citizens, um, they haven't had the, the wage increase or the wealth effect that probably we've seen here in Australia or in parts of the United States. And you've also started to see in the United States, uh, there's been no wage increases other than uh, the middle and upper class and they're all starting to see other people get ahead and they're starting to say, well, they won't, what's in it for me? And then when you start to look and say, what's in it for me? And you, you look at the world in 2000, it had a total debt of uh, 2.1 trillion. The, some of the economists in the room will correct me. Uh, 2007, I think it was around about 7.2 trillion. And then in uh, the McKinsey report in 2014, it was about 28.4 trillion. And people now are starting to say, hey, how are we going to get out of this? Because I haven't got anything, I've got no disposable income. How am I going to get out of it? The corporations uh, have got their balance sheets in fair shape. You'll all remember we all went through the era when the investment bankers were telling us we had lazy balance sheets and high leverage, you've got to leverage up. That's been corrected. And there's been a lot of uh, government spending, in particularly in Europe and, uh, and to a certain extent the UK and, and certainly in the United States, probably not in the productive areas that you would see generating the opportunity for wealth creation for the individual workers. And you're not seeing them getting the opportunities that other people are getting. So this America first bit, um, People in the European scene are saying, well, uh, let's, let's sort of uh, not worry about Great Britain getting out. 
even though they tell them that's going to cost them a fortune to get out. So you, you get to see a lot more debate about the exit amount that Great Britain will have to pay to get out of the European Union. Uh, so I, I see it more of a nationalistic trend. Uh, what's it going to do for companies? Well, I think if America drops its tax rate from 35 down to 15, the world better hang on because uh, all of a sudden it becomes a real competitive game. Now, whether they want to get back into exporting remains to be seen. They want to bring back their two trillion that's foreign investment offshore and they want to start to manufacture back in the United States. Whether they're going to get back into the export game with a, with a US dollar up where it is, mm. I think there's some, some very interesting re-corrections in currencies to be undertaken. So the currency wars that you've seen emerge, they've only just started. Can I just, uh, yes, you, yeah, ab absolutely. Thanks very much. Uh, to come back to your original question, mm. <coughs> I think what's happened in France is extraordinary yeah. within the context of, uh, of the question. What we had in the first round of the presidential elections, there were 11 candidates, as you probably know there are two runoffs for the presidential election, eight of the 11, the centrepiece of their platform was a Frexit out of, the U out of the European Union. And of the two extreme parties, the extreme left, the extreme right, there were 42% of the votes. Now, Emmanuel Macron was elected president, and he's elected on a platform, his own platform, of strengthening relationships with the European Union. He's already been to see Angela Merkel, struck a wonderful relationship up with her to rebuild a strong Europe. The interesting thing again is that his movement, and it's a movement called En Marche, which is moving ahead, isn't even a party. Now in June there's going to be the Legislative Assembly elections, 577 seats, and he doesn't have one of them, not one of them. So where we're going from here in France, and what that's going to mean for the future of Europe, and what the reaction to the President is going to be, the President was elected as a man not on the basis of his policies, but because he was the one who was standing against Marine Le Pen, the extreme right. So I think that this is a, <laughs> a great deal of uncertainty to what the current uh, and future business arrangements are going to be. The relationship between France, um, its approach to Brexit, and of course the relationship to the rest of Europe. So I think that that's a very interesting case to look at in the context of very recent developments on the global arena. Mm. And if I can just follow up on, on, on that and take you uh, into your core expertise, which is around trade. I mean, there certainly is a, a, a commentary running that, you know, that these votes are essentially against trade and that, you know, if you talk about the, Rust, the populations in the Rust Belt that supported Brexit, that supported Donald Trump, that they are, um, that they've lost out in the process of globalization and um, on the one hand, we see Donald Trump, you know, talking tough on China. On the other hand, he probably, he just appointed probably the most consummate Washington insider as his trade representative. So we have to sort of weigh up what that means. But where do you think trade is heading? We've had tremendous economic gains for the past two decades on the WTO, the opening of China. Where, where are we headed in, with political leaders in trade today? I think that's a very good question. Um, and the answer is, I don't think we know. I mean, we've had a multilateral trading system which is based on multilaterally agreed rules which were enforceable through a dispute settlement mechanism that worked. There were rights and obligations and whatever. So we didn't have com bilateral confrontations between countries. We had disputes over whether the, the laws, the rules, principles that have been agreed to by consensus were being respected or not. Now, since 2000, there's been really a marginalisation of the global trading system. There's been a proliferation of free trade areas. There are 450 of them. And while the multilateral system is based on non-discrimination, regional trade agreements are the antithesis of that. They're based on 
discrimination. You give preference to one country, but not to another. Maybe that's coming unstuck now, but we've seen that uh, um, Trump is not prepared to go ahead with the TPP negotiations. The Transatlantic Trade and Investment Treaty seems to be going nowhere. The NAFTA Treaty is to be renegotiated. Um, also, it's not at all clear that Trump will respect rulings of the WTO. Now, if he doesn't, why should anybody else respect them? That puts us on a very, very shaky path for the coming years. So I think that, um, as a very direct answer to your question, I think the future is very, very uncertain with respect to how the multilateral trading system is going to operate in the coming years. And that's a real worry. Um, I, I think even more significant is the fact that um, multilateral trade deals have always been hard in the US, but it's often taken the, the president, um, the United States president, to push it through. And they've often done that with support from both parties, both the Democrats and Republicans. For the first time in a long time since I can remember, you might comment on this, we have a president who's not going to lift a finger to try and get through a multilateral agreement uh, with the consensus of the both, both major parties. He's already changing a lot of what the Republican Party does. The Democrats can be led there if they've got a president who can do it, but they're more predisposed to be against trade than the Republicans are um, sort of um, in terms of policy terms. So um, I can't see the prospects for any advancement in multilateral agreements in the US happening anytime soon while Trump is there. I think that's, that's the case, despite the effort of the rest of the Republican Party or parts of the Democrat Party. Um, the contrary is true. And I'm not sure, Don, where, where, where Donald Trump is going in relation to um, manufacturing and um, rebuilding America, I guess, on what it used to be or what they believe it used to be. When you think that um, manufacturing makes up about 8% of the workforce in the US and about 10, 12% of, of GDP, uh, much less than services, which is not being talked about, when retail is under threat anyway, and it's got much bigger dislocation because of technology than anything else that's happening in the US, you would think that that effort on manufacturing is not going to bear much fruit. Um, and there's going to be significant disappointment, I would have thought, when, when the outcomes are not going to be there for those that have been promised. And I think that that's going to be quite significant. I'm not sure if you'll com commentary on that, but I just can't see where that economic direction is going. Steve, I have a wonderful quote for you. I wrote it down. The interview with um, Donald Trump with NBC's Meet the Press, the interviewer, Chuck Todd, his name is, suggested that trade policies of President Trump could run afoul of the WTO. President Trump replied, it doesn't matter. If that's the case, we're going to pull out. The WTO deals are a disaster, Chuck. The World Trade Organization is a disaster. Now, of the 164 members of the WTO, my observation is the country that benefited most from the WTO is the United States. If, the w if uh, President Trump pulls out of the WTO, why would anybody else bother to do anything else but not obey the rules, the concepts, and the principles which have been established? And just a quick uh, comment on, I think that the uh, border tax adjustment that's being proposed by the Congress at the moment, it was to be just a straight import penalty on imports from China, but Donald Trump still prefers that because he thinks that the destination-based border tax adjustment is too complicated. He just can't get his mind around that, so he's going for the straight confrontation. This <laughs> violates the WTO just at every level. It's an import um, penalty, and it's an export subsidy. Can I uh, just sort of answer that? The on, on the uh, he'll trade he'll trade the VAT for his VAT. I'd say there's a big push with all the economists over there now to introduce a VAT into the United States, and they're one of the few nations that hasn't got a VAT. So I think you might see some some interesting uh, horse trading as to how the tax goes. Can I come back to the trade bit? <clears throat> because 
doesn't matter what you say, unless you've got seaborne capacity to take vessels into your nations, you ain't going to trade. And when, when it all started, when the iron ore thing started back in 2000, the first signal that we picked up wasn't from economic modelling. It was from a trading desk of a, a ship trader sitting in Singapore that said, you better have a look at some of the forward orders of some of the shipping capacity out of Brazil into China. And that's how it started. The clamour to work out where you could drop all of the you, what you want to trade started to come into, fo into the fore. You have a nation called India, 1.3 million people, under a very good Prime Minister by the name of Modi, who's now starting to make noises that maybe India might start to get into the export trade, and they're starting to look at their currency as to where they can take advantage. India is probably, and you, you haven't read too much about it yet, probably the, the, the leading nation now on what's happening in the biotechnology front. If I can give you an example of children born, uh, not to the middle classes, but to the lower classes, were nobodies. They didn't have a birth certificate, they had no recognition and they had no future. They are now starting to get thumbprints, fingerprints of children, every child that's born in the place. They're starting to get their, their vision recorded. And all of a sudden, they've opened up some savings banks for these deprived children. And already they've got something like 30 million US dollars in these little savings banks for children that were nobodies. And this is the sort of stuff that you're starting to see occur. So when people start to talking about trade, the trade will still be there for the existing nations. And they'll, they'll pose and they'll play around with their currencies to see what they can do. But you've got to now start to deal very, very much with what's happening in India and what's going to happen in China when they start to dump steel and dump some of the other commodities after they get into full capacity. So let's bring this to, um, and I'm going to open it up for questions in a second. So get so get ready. Um, let's bring this to what's to to what we're to what we're experiencing in Australia. What this means for Australia. So if I were to put a proposition to you, it would sort of be this: two pillars of Australian prosperity since World War II have been the provision of a security blanket over the Asia Pacific by the United States and an increasing trend toward free trade. And Australia has tr benefited tremendously from both of those. Are they under threat in the current environment? And four years from now, assuming we get to the end of a Trump presidency and term in office, assuming, economists like to make assumptions, um, how should Australia position itself? How do we make sure that Australia maintains its prosperity through this period of uncertainty over the next four years? Well, Amy, you're absolutely right. In the, in the post-war era, um, if we go back to 1947, Australia was a major player in uh, the creation of GATT. There were 23 member countries and Australia was a leading player in creating GATT. I could give you lots of figures. Between 1947 and now, world trade has increased value in value terms by 310 times, in volume terms by 60 times. 23 members now are 164 members. This has brought predictability and stability to the trading system, which has assisted us enormously. Now, it's true. In the Keating Hawke years, most of our involvement in terms of trade negotiations was low key because we liberalised unilaterally. But what we need from here on in is a solid trading system for medium sized countries like ourselves, which is rules based, where there won't be bilateral confrontation based on political power, economic power, or any other form of leverage. That's what we have to struggle for. Now, can we get it? That's two. 
is an unknown. But we have what's coming up is the next uh, G7, there's a G20, there's a GATT ministerial meeting all taking place this year. We should look at the situation at the highest political level, head of government level, and try and find a way to work with the system that we've got to avoid what has happened, and that is shifting it out of the mainstream of international trade. That's in Australia's interest, no question about it. And that won't be led by Donald Trump, that's for sure. Whether it will be led by other countries, who we would have to turn to would be Japan and China and the BRICS and medium-sized countries, but push very hard to bring some sort of predictability and stability into the world trading system. And I come back, this I guess is based on my WTO, 18 years at WTO. But if you're trading according to mutually agreed concepts, principles and rules, which are implemented through a legally binding structure, a dispute settlement system with a strong compliance mechanism, then we're on solid ground. But if we're not going in that direction, we're in big trouble in the coming years. I agree with that up to a point. Um, yep. my, my dilemma, when, when, we, when we change the iron ore pricing from benchmark pricing to market clearing prices, and we were told by the Chinese government we had to take the board of BHP up to China, and we were told that you, you must accept market, the uh, benchmark pricing, and we said, sorry, uh, we, you, you're now in, a, in an open market and uh, it'll be market clearing prices that we'd rely on. The iron ore price went to 176 bucks a tonne because the inefficient steel millers that represented a big voting con constituency in China were paying that price on the black market for it. And they were probably getting it from the major steel mills, they might have been feeding a bit of it too. So I think we've just got to sort of watch where we trade and how we trade and and what are the terms within which we trade because the benchmark pricing was an agreement that uh, Japan and China had to deal with commodities generally and uh, a little fellow by the name of Marius Kloppers was the guy that carried the brunt of all that and, and, and broke that down and we were starting to get terms of trade from three years back to three months sometimes back to a month, we were starting to get freight considerations. All of these little operational things that sometimes you take for granted were all up for grabs. And, and, and I think under a bilateral type arrangement, the same thing's going to happen. And I think probably that'll be a good thing for a transitionary period to get us back onto some sort of stable ground. I agree with Gary that it's in Australia's interest to have rules-based multilateral agreements on trade. Um, it's in our long-term interest for that to happen and that's proved to be the case over a period of time. There's a few self-evident facts. Our biggest trading partner is China. That's our biggest trading partner right now and it has slipped over to China. Uh, Don, what was it, about 10 years ago or thereabouts? Ten, uh, something like that. Sure, our biggest investment partner is the US. I think we have to wait out the US, that is, wait out Donald Trump. Um, wait for the conditions to be better again. Um, we need an alliance and support from the US. There's no question about that. It's a great source of investment uh, from, for Australia more broadly. Um, it's a significant alliance. It has been built uh, since uh, World War II and we should not ignore it. Um, but. Um, if we can look at some of the architecture in the absence of the US um, uh, with other countries, we should, we should pursue it. We should pursue it in the meantime. Um, I mean, China would have an appetite for this. You've mentioned India. They may have an appetite to it. I'd, I'd love India to get organised and effective. Um, it's always had great potential, hasn't it, with $1.3 billion, but it's never, ever realised its potential, and we always think it's going to happen, and it never does. So I hope you're right. I hope it becomes less bureaucratic. I hope it actually is able to achieve things because it has proved to date that it is not able to meet any of the expectations that have been set for it. In any event, I think we need to look at alternative architecture, wait out Trump, and then try and get back into um, mainstream multi multilateral agreements again.
Yeah. Mm. Well, I might turn to the audience now and ask if anybody has a question for the panel that they want to put to panelists. Yes, please. Do we need a... Oh. Uh, thanks. Uh, my name is Campbell Robinson. I actually work for Monash College downstairs. Um, my background is sort of in management consulting. Uh, my question would be just sort of, I guess, around the role of neoliberalism and how that's sort of actually playing into populism, uh, given that, I guess, the incomes of the middle class haven't actually been growing. They haven't sort of seen a lot of the benefits in the last 20 years from, I guess, increasing global trade. Uh, how that actually sort of plays into that, given that, I guess, say, the IMF now has sort of said that neoliberalism is causing uh, a large amount of inequality around and how that plays into, I guess, the election of Donald Trump as well as sort of the Brexit vote, as well as, I guess, the, the uh, anti-trade and immigration sort of uh, positions that those countries have. Yeah, there certainly has been a uh, backlash against globalization. Um, I mention again France because it's where I happen to live. But the support for the far right and the far left is very much founded on the basis that many people feel they've just missed out. They've missed out on it. And that's led to the reaction, the nationalist reaction, we'll close our borders, we'll increase our barriers to trade, we'll protect our domestic industries, what Marine Le Pen calls intelligent protectionism. Intelligent protectionism, it means if ever a job is going to be lost, she's there to make sure it isn't lost. But the anti-globalization sentiment is really based on the thinking that many people have been bypassed by the whole process. Maybe they have. Maybe it's time that we rethink the globalization process. The redistribution of, we know that there are gains from trade, but if the redistribution of the gains from trade are not shared equitably within a country, then neoliberalism doesn't mean much at all. And I think that's a challenge for governments to put in place the right sort of mechanisms to permit them to share the benefits of trade in a much more equitable manner than what we've seen in the past. Uh, I agree with Gary, but I wouldn't um, – see, Don is right. It's, when you say popularism, and I said popularism too, but there's still not a – there still wasn't a technical majority for Trump in the US. So when you say popularism, you've got to actually temper what you're saying. Um, if there wasn't um, a global financial downturn in the aftermath of that, um, if there wasn't um, a mass immigration around the world – uh, causing difficulty and dislocation around the world, um, then you you may not have had the same conditions as was there for Trump to get in the first place. So it's not as simple as saying it's just a popular position. So I think these things can change, and I think it's the responsibility of uh, parties and governments around the world to explain better the benefits of trade, the benefits of globalisation, and how they can assist and support uh, people in that move, because it's going to happen. You know, I mean, it's not as if, you, I mean, you shouldn't lie to people. Globalisation is going to continue, and we shouldn't actually lie. Technology dislocation is probably bigger than anything else that's occurred around the world currently. And we should be frank and open about that, and we should um, assist in the process of change um, that's going on so that we make sure we bring people with us. And that's, that's important, I think, as part of it. And I think that's the lessons out of largely what's happened um, to some degree. I agree with Gary on this, that there is a convergence of the far left and the far right. This is quite remarkable, really. And the convergence is around three things. It's around immigration. The far left is as anti-immigration as the far right. You know, you look at the Green Party's policy, for example, on general immigration. It's opposed to population growth. Um, this, is, this is the case generally. Um, in relation to protectionism, uh, I don't know how many times I've fought in the Labor Party against protectionist policies, and we've won that debate uh, over a long period of time, but the far left is pr as protectionist as the far right. And they're both using nationalism. So um, my point is, I guess, that the fracturing of the centre, 
uh, to, to have a healthy democracy, having a strong centre right and a strong centre left is good long term for a democracy. And that is what is under challenge currently now because both those institutional parties around the world, whether they're social democrats or whether they're conservative parties, whatever they are, um, have not really explained the benefits of, uh, uh, of globalisation, the benefits of trade, and have not brought people with them in the process. And we're paying the price for that now. Yes, I, I've got no argument with that. And, and from a business point of view, though, you've got to play with the ball that's in front of you, particularly if you've got a global footprint. And you do have a, you do have a, a feel for the economies of the various nations that you might be trying to influence. And, and to me, it, that's going to be a, a, how that plays out into the political scene. And it'll come back to taxation policy and that's going to be right on our doorstep very shortly. And if you're not competitive with your taxation policy, then you won't be in the game. So can I ask a follow-up question on that, which is, Don, you made a, you made a comment um, after Trump was elected, quoted in The Australian, and, and you talked about how politicians need to consider leading in a new way. So we've got this fracturing of the middle that Steve referenced. And I'm wondering, in the business community, do, does business need to think about leading in a new way? Sure. I mean, business has participated and led globalization as much as political decision makers have, and multinationals have larger balance sheets than a lot of countries. So what is the role of business in, in holding, holding the middle together, if that's the objective? One of, one of the best things that I've seen introduced anywhere in the world is at Stanford University. They've they've now set themselves up, and I've got to give this to Monash, they've set themselves up with a, with a, with a group of business people and, and, and they're encouraging industries to come to this research group within the university. You have to leave all your prejudices at the door and you start to, to start to thrash out for the governments what sort of a policy is required in the community <coughs> today that's going to be fair and just and deliver what the objectives are. That is working extremely well and more and more industries, particularly on the west coast now, are starting to, rather than just go and lobby governments, they're going to governments as a body and say, here's a policy, please consider it. And business have to take a proactive position in what they're doing. And, and that's the first time I've seen in a long time uh, a business group that's effectively starting to uh, be part of a community. And I think once that, once that happens, then you'll start to bring in uh, the, the people that, aren't, that are disadvantaged in what's been happening with the globalisation. Hmm. Can I, just, can I just make a, a comment on tax and disagree with Don a bit on this? Um, you've got to be careful what you wish for in some ways. Um, it would be easily, easy to slavishly follow a low company tax regime of the US. But if you shift the tax burden uh, to a non-progressive tax, a broad-based consumption tax, now some of that's good, but um, uh, so you, you, you put um, more costs on individuals uh, effectively in distributive terms, it's not going to advance the very issues we talked about before where people feel disenfranchised largely. Um, low wage growth, high costs. Uh, we've got to get that balance right. Uh, we can't just simply say that the panacea for the world economy in following the US is to reduce company tax and therefore go for higher growth as a result of it. It seems to be a one-track policy and it's not the only policy. Um, and I think it would be a mistake to give away our progressive tax system in this country. We'd be falling into the very trap that we're seeing around the world currently of not distributing the gains effectively by not having a progressive tax system more broadly. So I'd, I'd just temper that. And I'd temper it from another point of view as well. If we can't pay our way, if we have a credit downgrading, um, we will suffer long term in this country. And if we have a revenue base which is not sustainable, in the long term. We should never, for example, in the mining boom, given away personal income tax cuts to the level we gave them away. We should never have 
had middle class welfare to the extent which we had it with the baby bonus and supplements and all the rest of it, which was unaffordable, uh, we would have been better putting that into productive capacity of the economy and kept a, um, a, a fair, reasonable tax system uh, intact as a result. We've been trying to play catch up ever since. So I'll just put an alternative view on that. I'll take another question from the audience. Yes, oh, sorry. Sorry. We have I, I, I hear what Steve <laughs> says. I don't necessarily agree with him, but it's, uh, I, think, I think the broader base taxation is certainly where we've got, a, we've got a head. I'm not convinced that that broader base taxation base has been distributed as, as soundly as it should have been. Do we have, oh, thank you. Hi, uh, Gavin Dixon from um, the MBA class of 2013. Um, following up on Don's point in getting universities involved, uh, I think it was Laura Tingle's article in the monthly just recently linked not income with the vote for Donald Trump. Actually, she, the, the data showed it's actually people who may have been disaffected with globalisation, but they were reasonably well off compared to, they weren't from low wage families. It was actually low education that was driving that vote. So I wonder, and we might be in the right place to consider this, is it about education more so than uh, globalisation? Um, I, think it's a, I think it's a bit of both. I, uh, I saw Laura Tingle's article, but if you look at the Brexit vote and you look at where um, a large, larger majorities were, they were in very low income areas. And in fact, that's the inherent criticism of the Labor Party leader. He did nothing to convince people in his own electorate areas, in his own constituencies of the value of staying in the European Union. So um, I think it's a, it's a bit of a mix. It's not only high income earners. I think there is segments of the US um, constituency who were low income, who did vote for Donald Trump, um, who were dislocated in because of the, the work. So I think it's a bit of both on that, and I don't think we can ignore that. It wouldn't have taken that much for the Democratic Party to win that election, basically. I mean, it's remarkable that they s spent twice as much, I think, or more than Trump, did not campaign in the Midwest, which um, Bill Clinton or Barack Obama would never, ever make that mistake. It was extraordinary, and I still don't know what the theme of their election was. I think what's happened in the US is largely You've got a Republican Party who believes the answer to every question is a middle income tax cut. Whatever the question is, that's the answer. And you've got a Democrat Party that's become a party of identity, that is of minority groups who are really dominating the party structure and what they stand for. And it's becoming quite dysfunctional. I think that's part of the problem. And Trump was able to capitalise on one part of that. I think that with uh, globalisation, how acceptable it is to the public and whatever, it depends on how the government deals with it. And what I would think is a uh, perfect example of how globalisation should be dealt with in the sense that globalisation does mean people lose jobs. People have to be reallocated. And when I look at the um, Australian motor vehicle industry, Steve, <laughs> we started that process with John Button in 1984. It's taken us 35 years. Now that's the way to do it. You give advanced warning as to what the next step is going to be and then you progressively move to a situation where you do become internationally competitive or you phase, phase out the industry. Now I know that's dear to your own heart and I know that you um, headed the inquiry into what protection we should have or should not have maintained when the Labor government came in. But are you yourself satisfied with the way in which, well the end result of course, the phasing out of the motor vehicle industry and uh, the way it was done? And if I can be really a little bit, um, I guess, cheeky could be with the word. Are submarines the new motor vehicle industry for Australia? <laughs> right, okay. Um, 
I think it's one of the great tragedies in Australia that we don't have a passenger motor vehicle industry. It was never about tariffs. It was all about exchange rates. Uh, all the parent companies, Toyota Motor Company, uh, General Motors, um, uh, Ford Motor Company, um, their view was that to have a passenger motor vehicle uh, uh, industry in Australia, you needed the exchange rate roughly around 85 cents. That was what they based their economic models on. We got to parity, the government panicked, and they said we didn't need a car industry anymore. It was the biggest non-farm export that Australia had, six billion in exports. Every taxi in the Middle East, in um, Dubai, not Dubai, in Saudi Arabia, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, was a Camry built here in Melbourne. Uh, the, Cap the Caprice was converted to a Chevrolet and was sold as a luxury car over there. Six billion of export. Just imagine with a dollar at 74, 75 cents, what sort of exports you'd be having now. It was never about the domestic car industry. That was useful, of course. We had a low tariff regime. We had more car brands than any other country in the world. That's a good thing. Um, we had basically zero manufacturing tariff, or 5%, which is almost nothing. Um, and uh, I think it's a tragedy to don't hold on to it. But you're right, the biggest new subsidies are now in the Defence Material, uh, Material Organisation in terms of shipbuilding in this country. It has been skewed to where it's electorally popular for it to occur. Um, it favours uh, overly a domestic market. The thing they said they would never do with the, um, the car industry, it should internationalise. Um, that's not the case with um, uh, the, the um, uh, submarines and frigates and the other, uh, the other procurement that's on. And basically there is a taxpayer subsidy in there uh, which will be there for a long time to come. So it's ironic that we are favouring one industry and not the other industry. I find that remarkable and unusual. I actually agree with you. I th you know, not surprisingly, I thought um, the Hawke and Keating governments in opening up the Australian economy and bringing down tariffs, bringing in competition policy, uh, eliminating private monopolies around the country, bringing in foreign banks, floating the Australian dollar, was the best thing that's ever happened to this country. Uh, it built in, built productivity into our economy, it externalised us, it opened us up. We were protectionists before that and we became an open trading economy after that. But it was done with a social safety net. And I admire what John Button did. We had a social security safety net. We had a passenger motor vehicle and textile clothing and footwear scheme which assisted those who were displaced to find alternative work and training into other work. Um, and we had an industrial safety net as part of it too. So you, ha you had safety nets while you were doing it. And I think it was done quite well, so well, that you had both Bill Clinton and Tony Blair who came to Australia to see what we did and try to copy it. And that's how well and effectively it was done. So I agree with you wholeheartedly, at, and um, I'd be interested in Don's comment, because the steel industry was in big, big trouble uh, um, at that period as well and the, the button steel plan was instrumental really in saving that industry and putting it on a sound footing in the future. Rationalising it, yes. Picking where it should go, yes, but um, stabilising it for the future. But Steve, of course we're exporting um, Camrys. We subsidised every worker in the industry $35,000 a year. We had eight manufacturers at one stage, how could we possibly get the economies of scale to be internationally competitive? Um, still. I just, I, sorry, I, <laughs> I can't, um, John Button was right. We, his plan was to um, go from eight manufacturers to three. It went from eight to four. Mitsubishi Motor Company survived for some time, mostly in South Australia. So he was quite right. Um, the reason Ford was the weak link in the automotive companies is it chose not to export. Despite the imploring from federal and state governments that occurred, it decided that it didn't want an export platform. Um, yes, there was subsidies, but the subsidies were all skewed to um, export and innovation, and it, and it was always designed that these subsidies would go once it got to a volumetric level of export in the future. And it wasn't a straight subsidy to the workforce, it was a subsidy to the parent companies to allow them to remain here so long as they export increased unit costs 
and therefore um, assisted some of the component companies by bidding in like both locally and internationally. That was always the aim. Thanks, Steve. The, on the steel industry, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting history in Australia. Subsidies and transfer pricing are two issues that have to be part of a small economy and it has to be policed and rigorously policed for, for, for the very, very reasons that Gary pointed out. With the steel industry, the biggest decision that I've ever been involved with was when we decided we would float this, the uh, steel division out of uh, BHP. And it was, it was just horrendous. It had everything. It had all the political influences. It had the local influences. It had the, uh, the environmental uh, uh, pieces that you had to uh, restore. It gave... Once we once we got it out of a conglomerate balance sheet, the government assisted it, I think, for probably three years until they reinvented themselves with a with a technology and a, and a different strategy. And you have a look at Bluescape Steel now, and it it it'll contribute extremely well to any infrastructure that uh, happens in this country over the next 15 years. And I think that can happen with all industries if you're sensible with what you do with the subsidies. And I think the classic, the classic disaster we've got in this country is what we're doing with renewable energies. The, the subsidies that are going there that's on your electricity bills and being hidden as, a, as, a, as another tax is just scandalous. And the sooner we sort that out and you start to have a proper group of people sit down, get rid of the prejudices and start to think about what's the solution across all of the sources of energy because energy and water is going to be the big things that our kids are going to worry about. The sooner we do that, the better. Mm. And the global climate change and Kyoto Protocol are another uh, sort of question, live question in relation to uh, where, where Trump takes his politics next. Well, obviously, he's not, he's not going to support it. I'd mm. say he's going to pull out of the Paris Agreement, and, and probably that's a good thing. And then, then people will then sit down, as they are over at Stanford now, and they've come up, this, there's an excellent paper out that they've put up, and you just cannot have prejudice against one particular form of energy. You've got to get the mix, you've got to get it right, and then you've got to put the safeguards in place so that the total objective is to provide cheap energy, which we had 10 years ago. Well, well. Question from, from our audience? Yes, please. Hi, I'm Mike. Wait, sorry, hang on for the mic. Sorry, thank you. Um, my name's Philippa Thode from the National Transport Commission. I suppose my question to the three of you is if there's disaffected people in the States, there's disaffected people in Europe, there's disaffected people here, what would be the one thing that you would do to change them to be not so disaffected? Well, first of all, I'd, I'd make sure that the safety net that's put in place is working as it should be working. That would be the first piece, and I think that's probably starting to occur. I'd stop... Uh, politicians promising things that aren't funded uh, in terms of uh, what we're doing on the social safety net piece. And then I'd turn to industry and say, right, now what are we going to do about this? We've got to have, I, I, can, I, can, I think the miners do it particularly well in, in work programs for disadvantaged people. And I think all industries have to do that. I look at, I look at the revenue statements of a lot of companies and, and you look at the education piece that's there, the first thing that gets cut in a budget is the education piece. And that's why people are crying out about services at banks or people not knowing knowledge of products wherever you're going. We've got to get back into that education piece. Not everyone's going to be intellectually uh, adept at, at delivering and executing a strategy but you've got to be able to provide jobs for those people and that has to be bought into all budgets. But again, 
the safety net has to be there, it has to be policed, and then I think you could even put an incentive in place for a tax deduction for those that aren't skilled so that you can reskill them. Um, Um, I don't disagree with Don. Um, I, I think you do need a strong social safety net, and we do have that. And yeah, look, across um, continental Europe, they have that as well, and across Scandinavia, that is true. And in the UK, the US is not as strong. We are similar to Canada, I guess, um, in Northern America. Um, but I think there's no replacement for a strong economy in reducing disaffection. Um, a strong economy will wash out a lot of other issues. Uh, disposable income that people have to spend uh, will be the most significant thing that obviates against um, disaffection and so we've got to strive for that all the time and, uh, and I, that's why I think we need to have a strong trading position with um, multilateral trade, um, that's why we need to have the most competitive and productive industries we, ca we, we can have. Uh, that's why we need to invest in education because our future is not going to be competing um, in um, uh, some manufactured goods which uh, we can't compete in because of a high wage, high cost country that we are. We have to invest in education because it's going to be the most strong um, benefit going forward for our economy is the intelligence of our population and the capacity to do the things which we know are going to be useful in the rest of the world. Um, as an economist, I have no doubt what the answer is, and that is what we need is growth. We need growth. And as the, going back to the earlier question from the gentleman, to have a government that's going to distribute the growth benefits in an equitable and sensible manner. That's what we need. So, so can I probe on that question further? Because in Australia we haven't had a, I mean, Practically, you know, probably many people who are being educated at Monash at the moment can't remember the last recession that we had in Australia. And we do have relatively strong growth. And we do have, particularly in Victoria, very strong population growth. We have very strong employment growth. Um, we have not fabulous, but decent wage growth. And we have actually a very equitable distribution of income, uh, household income, unlike the United States. So there are a lot of things that are actually going very well. And so we talk about disaffection. Where do you think it's coming from? And is it a matter of distribution, or is it a matter of community expectation, What's, what government may be promising, and what do we do? How, how do we actually address it when things are, do seem to be going pretty well? Um, can I just um, comment on that? Uh, yeah, comment on the, the question of disaffection. I think you're right, Amy, on, on most of those indicators, and it's why we have um, less dislocation and less um, dissatisfaction in Australia, and certainly in Victoria and New South Wales. Um, I'm actually very critical of the media more generally for um, looking for examples of Brexit and Trump around the world, and they have been looking for it. It's almost as if their deaths say to them, you've got to find in every country examples of where that's occurred. So in Australia, what is it? It's Pauline Hanson. When another country, it's Le Pen and so on. Um, a lot of it is confected. Um, the example of that was Western Australia. What, how well did one nation go in Western Australia? The major party got close to 50%, one of the major mainstream parties. It was a business as usual election. Um, we've always had a group um, mostly coming out of Queensland, a bit out of Western Australia, whether it's uh, Cl Clive Palmer or um, whether it's um, Hanson, there's always been some disaffection in those areas and it's not surprising looking at the demographics of those areas, but it's not much different to what it's always been. So I think we've overblown it. We've overblown it because of the media, media commentary that we must find it. And in our case too, it's very unlikely to be there. In a system where there's compulsory voting, you're almost, it's almost impossible to get those conditions that happen in the US. Almost impossible when you've got compulsory voting. People have to vote, and that makes an enormous difference to the outcome um, than if people are skewed and choose to vote because they're motivated on an issue. Um, and I think uh, those conditions, I'm not saying it's 
it's perfect, but I don't think it has the same disaffection that we're seeing around the rest of the world. Amy, that uh, I hate to put a damper on it, but I said 28 trillion. It'd be up to 30 trillion now, and that's the elephant in the room. Mm. And and until if you if you get a, a one percent interest rate rise, you're going to have carnage in the streets. You will because of the the individual debt that people have run up on their cards, and that's going to be a sad indictment on us. And that's going to that's going to test out our safety nets. That's really going to test it out. Did you want to? No. Yeah. Well, we, we have to draw this to a close, which is unfortunate because um, I think it's been absolutely fascinating. Um, Steve, I thought your final comments actually were very, very interesting, and they started to touch upon an issue that I guess is of concern to a whole lot of us. You know, it goes back to that really good question what would you do to deal with disaffection? I think there's two kinds of disaffection. One is the disaffection that the three of you represented, which is the real disaffection. That's coming from real life, things that are happening. The other is the perceived disaffection. And the perceived disaffection, Steve, you laid at the feet of the media. I'm going to suggest you it actually should be laid at the feet of our leaders who have lost the art of three things, the three Cs. Conviction, courage of their convictions and communication. You think back, when was the last time you had conviction politics in this country? And I'll put it to you, I think it was about three months after John Howard's last election win in 2004. That was the time when Arthur Sinodinus retired uh, as the Chief of Staff to John Howard. Tony Nutt took over and politics then took over. And since then, we've had very little evidence of conviction politics. As a result, you have very little evidence of courage or convictions because nothing to be courageous about. And most importantly, our leaders don't tell the narrative. They don't tell it what, it, what it's about, how, you know, what really is happening. So the perceived disaffection can gather pace and it's the sort of populism that we, we talk about, that perceived disaffection. So I think that you know, we, the, it's something that our leaders really need to focus on to, um, uh, to, to, to really address some of these issues, otherwise we'll continue this race to the bottom that some of us might perceive as occurring at the moment in, uh, in politics in this country. Um, before I thank our, our, our speakers, I want to draw your attention to the fact that this is the first of these leadership panels. Um, we'll be very interested to receive your feedback, but um, for my own part, I'm, I'm pretty pleased. I think it went really well, and I'd like to think that the follow-on ones that we're going to have are going to be um, just as interesting. Um, if you've got your diaries, uh, July the 26th, we have one on digital disruption. And we have three or four um, uh, speakers that will be involved in that. Um, one will be a senior executive of Kogan, which is the, um, the online uh, discount uh, seller in a whole range of different areas. Uh, one will be uh, the general manager of Uber. And Uber is Uberized in the world, as they say, uh, but has really disrupted uh, initially uh, the whole uh, motor vehicle transport industry and who knows where it might go from there. Um, the other one will be interesting, um, it'll be the digital, um, uh, digital executive of the National Rugby League and the disruption that could potentially occur in sport and sport and media. Uh, and then we will have um, perhaps one or two others, so we're dealing with that. September the 7th, Scott Keck, sitting here, member of the Business Advisory Board, is going to lead a panel on three things, three questions, property, equities or cash, what you should do. Property, equities or cash. Scott, of course, um, uh, Australia's leading valuer and advisor on property matters with Charter Keck, and then we'll have a leading share broker and a leading banker to talk about cash. So that'll be really interesting. And um, if you've got anything left at that stage after Trump's finished and uh, they've taxed you to the hilt, well, that'll be a very interesting one. And then we have another one coming up on entrepreneurship and then another one on sport and perhaps sport and business. So they're the sorts of leadership panels we're going to have and they're all designed to give you the expertise that we can draw together from people who are associated with Monash University and in particular the Monash Business School. Um, I want to briefly thank um, our panel and then Cobb Kearney, the uh, Dean of the Monash Business School, is going to close the proceedings. But can I say, Amy, you got launched into this and I told you tonight the way it was going to be run and you've done it superbly. Thank you so much. You've really got the panel going and the panel uh, were drawn together tonight. Interestingly, Gary's just come over from overseas. So he's just arrived and um, he said to me, am I doing a presentation? I said, no, you're not. I said, he said, what are the questions? I said, you'll find out when Amy asks them. 
Um, and, and Steve and Don were exactly the same. I said, you guys have got the intellectual capacity to deal with any question that I'm about to put to you. Let's have a conversation. And thank you so much to members um, who have arrived here today who have actually participated in a, a sort of a Q&A type style um, with that interaction. It's been really good. But can I thank the, the three speakers, the three panellists, if you like. You have been superb. Your intellectual um, capacity has shone through superbly and your communication powers. And Amy, you have handled the facilitation of this um, brilliantly. So please thank um, our, our panel. And Colm, if I can ask you to uh, close the proceedings on behalf of the Monash Business School. Thank you, Graham. Uh, I would like to thank Amy, Don, uh, um, Steve, uh, Gary, uh, Graham, uh, for having a fantastic approach to this uh, uh, event this evening. Um, I want to thank Richard Hall, I want to thank uh, uh, Sue Gillespie, I'm not going to go around the whole room, uh, uh, Helen, Helen Spittle, uh, um, yes, uh, Edward, uh, he's got a drink, I have to say thank you to him, uh, uh, Sue Gillespie, etc. Um, um, look, at this, this, uh, it's, we have worked so hard behind the scenes to launch the Monash Business School uh, and to begin to put it on a journey where we can be as good as we can. And uh, look at the quality of our advisory board and look at the quality of the people who are coming here today. Uh, it, I am so proud of what we are achieving and what we are going to achieve. So uh, let me not speak too much, but to say, above all, I want to thank every one of you who have come to be with us here uh, during the past few hours. Um, if you don't come, it doesn't make the event. So to everybody who has made this event, thank you very, very much.